Is this a worm? This? How about this? 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 Did you know that some people call these Christmas tree worms? Does that make it a worm? These are questions that taxonomists ask themselves all the time. Taxonomy, or classification, is the field of study in which all living things are organized into categories. Classifying is a very good way to stay organized by categorizing things by theme. For example, how Amazon.com does this by putting all of the items that they sell having to do with electronics under one folder. And whenever people classify, it also forces them to differentiate between them, look for differences. For instance, even though all three of these organisms are commonly called bears, this black bear, this panda bear, and this koala bear, Taxonomists have since studied these bears and differentiated between them, knowing now that koalas are actually more related to kangaroos, because like kangaroos, they give birth to tiny underdeveloped young that crawl from the vagina all the way to a pouch and then find a nipple in the pouch and drink milk there to finish their development. Meanwhile, these two bears are actually more closely related to us, because their young develop inside a uterus like us. So in a nutshell, taxonomists have to be very clever with their observational skills to be able to tell two organisms apart, even if they look alike. This guy, Carolus Linnaeus, is often considered the father of taxonomy. He was one of the first people to classify organisms by their relatedness. And so he gave each individual species its own name, and he divided them into groups that share the most common characteristics. Though the way we classify individual organisms has changed quite a bit, those two principles still drive taxonomy at its heart. In the rest of this video, we will first look at the naming system that Linnaeus developed, and then introduce some of the common groups of organisms. One of Linnaeus's most brilliant ideas was to realize that each organism needs a single name that all scientists use all the time. Common names are much too confusing. For example, what really is a worm? Or a flower? Or a lion? For example, when you say the word lion, are you talking about the large predatory cat? Or the agile and intelligent sea lion? Or the clever engineering ant lion? Much better to give them each their own name. And so that's what Linnaeus did, and what all modern taxonomists do. So how does the system work? First of all, this naming system is called binomial nomenclature. This is quite a mouthful, but it means something simple. Bi means two, and nom means name. So each organism gets two parts to its name, like Homo sapiens, which is the scientific name for humans. These names are in Latin, so that way French speakers, Chinese speakers, Indian speakers can all use the exact same language to describe an organism and not get mixed up in translation. They are always written in italics. And the first part of the name, which is called the genus, is always capitalized, while the second part of the name, called the species, is written in lowercase. With these consistent rules, Taxonomists all over the world that live through multiple centuries have been able to keep track of single organisms without mixing them up. But once they've named all of these organisms, what do they do with those names? A single list of all the organisms would be way too long. So they put the species into categories. Usually these categories have distinct characteristics, such as plantae tend to get their food from the sun, whereas fungi tend to get their food from dying organisms. But whenever they find an organism where they're not sure where it belongs, there's always another strategy they can take. This is the modern approach, sequencing the DNA and proteins. So when a taxonomist finds that the nucleotide sequences for this leptin gene are almost identical in gorillas, humans, and chimps, with only one letter different between the two, they know to put the humans, the chimps, and the gorillas in the same category. 
They can do the same for amino acid sequences and proteins and see that since human chimps and gorillas all have the exact same amino acids inside, but then for rhesus monkeys and horses and kangaroos, some of the amino acids are different. We know that these three are less related to us than these ones. And thus they can go in different taxa or categories. As they study these differences more and more, they can start constructing very finely branched trees in which they keep track of how many differences there are. For example, this tree was developed by sequencing the amino acids in a protein called cytochrome C. And because there are many differences between a human cytochrome C and a bread mold cytochrome C, we might guess that they are not very related to each other whereas a monkey and a human only have one nucleotide different, so they're much more related. These trees of relatedness do have large branches, and the next video will examine some of the major characteristics of each of the largest branches.